folks, it's my coach used to say it's go to time. It's go time now. Welcome to the Kaya Olson Show. I feel like I've been saying this for a couple of weeks now, but the 2020 race for president is down to the wire. Finally, 10 days until Election Day. I talked last week about the allegations against Hunter Biden and Joe Biden involving business dealings in Ukraine and China. Less than two hours before the debate on Thursday, the Biden's former business partner, he was actually the CEO of one of their entities, Tony Bobulinski, spoke to reporters. Here's his full statement. My name is Tony Bobulinski. I served as a lieutenant in the United States Navy with high security clearance. My father and grandfather both served for decades in our country's armed forces. Since leaving the Navy, I've been involved in various successful businesses, both in this country and abroad. I am making this statement to set the record straight about the involvement of the Biden family, Vice President Biden, his brother Jim Biden, and his son Hunter Biden in dealings with the Chinese. I've heard Joe Biden say that he's never discussed business with Hunter. That is false. I have firsthand knowledge about this because I directly dealt with the Biden family, including Joe Biden. I have also heard that Vice President Biden said on Tuesday that Senator Ron Johnson, the chair of the Senate Homeland Security Committee, should be ashamed for suggesting that Biden family sought to profit from their name. Well, here are the facts I know, and everything I'm saying is corroborated by emails, WhatsApp chats, agreements, documents, and other evidence. And the American people can judge for themselves. I brought, I guess, for record, three phones that spanned the years 2015 through 2018. These phones have never been held by anybody else besides myself. I was told this past Sunday by somebody who was also involved in this matter that if I went public this information, it'd be, it would bury all of us, man, the Bidens included. I have no wish to bury anyone. I have never been political. The few contributions I have made have been to Democrats. But what I am is a patriot and a veteran. To protect my family name and my business reputation, I need to ensure that the true facts are out there. In late 2015, I was approached by James Gillier, whom I had known for many years, about joining him in a deal which he said would involve the Chinese state-owned enterprise, CEFC China Energy, and what he called one of the most prominent families in the United States. I was informed first by Gillier, and then by Hunter Biden, and by Rob Walker, who was working with the Bidens, that the Bidens wanted to form a new entity with CFC, which was to invest in infrastructure, real estate, and technology in the U.S. and around the world. And the entity would initially be capitalized with $10 million and then grow to billions of dollars of investment capital. After months of discussion, I agreed at Gillier and Hunter Biden's request to become CEO of the entity to be called Sinohawk. Sino representing the Chinese side, Hawk representing Hunter Biden's brother Bo's favorite animal. And between February and May 2017, we exchanged numerous emails, documents, and WhatsApp messages concerning Sinohawk and its potential business. On May 2nd, 2017, the night before Joe Biden was to appear at the Milken Conference, I was introduced to Joe Biden by Jim Biden and Hunter Biden. At, and a, at my approximately hour-long meeting with Joe that night, we discussed the Biden's history, the Biden's family business plans with the Chinese, with which he was plainly familiar, at least at a high level. After that meeting, I had numerous communications with Hunter, Walker, Gillier, and Jim Biden regarding the allocation of the equity ownership of Sinohawk. On May 13, 2017, I received an email concerning allocation of equity, which says 10% held by H for the big guy. In that email, there's no question that H stands for Hunter, big guy for his father, Joe Biden, and Jim for Jim Biden. 
In fact, Hunter often referred to his father as the big guy or my chairman. On numerous occasions, it was made clear to me that Joe Biden's involvement was not to be mentioned in writing, but only face to face. In fact, I was advised by Gillian and Walker that Hunter and Jim Biden were paranoid about keeping Joe Biden's involvement secret. I also had a disagreement with Hunter about the funds CFC was contributing to Sinohawk. Hunter wanted $5 million of those funds to go to himself and his family. So he wanted the funds wired directly to an entity affiliated with him. I objected because that was contrary to our written agreements concerning Sinohawk. He said, referring to the chairman, his father, that CFC was really investing in the Biden family, that he held the Trump card, and that he was the one putting his family legacy on the line. He also said to me on May 17th, 2017, that CFC wanted to be my partner, to be partner with the Bidens. During these negotiations, I repeated to Hunter and others that Sinohawk could not be Hunter's personal piggy bank. And I demanded that proper corporate governance procedures be implemented for capital distributions. Hunter became very upset with me. CFC through, two, through July 2017 was assuring me the funds would be transferred to Sinohawk, but they were never sent to our company. Instead, I found out from Senator Johnson's September report that the $5 million was sent in August 2017 to entities affiliated with Hunter. Tomorrow, I will be meeting with the Senate committee members concerning this matter, and I will be providing to the FBI the devices which contain the evidence corroborating what I have said. So I will not be taking any questions at this time. I will not be taking questions at this time. The evidence sits on these three phones. I don't want to go into anything any further. Uh, this will all be discussed with uh, Senator Johnson and his committee, and the American people can decide what's fact. Thank you. Leave it to the media to ask him who paid his expenses to be there. That's the question everybody wants to know. Not... Do you think the Bidens are still in business with China? Do you think Russia or Iran have compromising information on the man who wants to be the American president? No. Who bought your plane ticket? Meanwhile, NPR shared a statement about the story, and in it, Terrence Samuels, NPR's managing editor, said, quote, We don't want to waste our time on stories that are not really stories, and we don't want to waste the listeners' and readers' time on stories that are just pure distractions. That's my NPR voice. Distractions from what? Russiagate? Adam Schiff's baloney? Why are we, the American taxpayers, still funding NPR? That's a question I would like answered. Here's another story NPR probably can't be bothered with. Joe Biden's outright lies about fracking. Here's the exchange from Thursday night. It's all a pipe dream, but you know what we'll do? We're going to have the greatest economy in the world. But if you want to kill the economy, get rid of your oil industry. You want and and what about fracking? All right. Now, let me now let me have, have let me allow fracking. Vice President I Biden to have respond. I never said I oppose fracking. You said it I, on tape. I did show the tape. Put it on your website. I'll put it on. Put it on the website. The fact of the matter is, Shows he's lit. flat lying. Does Joe Biden not think people remember these? No more. No new fracking. We, we are. We are going to get rid of fossil fuels. Well, like, what about say, stopping fracking and stopping yeah. pipes? Would there be any place for fossil fuels, including coal and fracking, in the Biden administration? No, we would, we would we would work it out. We would make sure it's eliminated. I guarantee you. I guarantee you, we're going to end fossil fuel, and I am not going to cooperate. No ability for the oil industry to continue to drill. Period. Ends. Number one. Three consecutive American presidents have enjoyed stints of explosive economic growth due to a boom in oil and natural gas production. As president, would you be willing to sacrifice some of that growth, even knowing potentially that it could displace thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of blue collar workers in the interest of transitioning to that greener economy? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. No more. No new fracking. Ten days, America. When we come back, Donald Trump Jr., this is The Kyle Olson Show.
Welcome back to the Kyle Olson Show. Ten days until Election Day. Ten days. Joining me now, I'm so honored, is Donald Trump Jr. Don, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. The allegations about Hunter Biden continue to come out. It's almost impossible to keep up with all of them. What's your reaction to how he was seemingly using his father's position as vice president to enrich himself? Well, listen, it's, it's disgusting, and I, I take it personally. Uh, the media, the Democrats, they spent three years literally accusing me of doing all the things that Hunter Biden was actually doing. Now, they found nothing because there was nothing. But now that it's on the Bidens, they have no interest in looking. I mean, they literally did the Russia, Russia, Russia nonsense for three years. I testified for 30 hours before the House and Senate. They said I committed treason. Hunter Biden's doing it, and it's not just the Ukrainians. Then it's also the 3.5 from the, the Putin associate in Russia and $1.5 billion from the Chinese government. I mean, it never ends. Joe Biden is compromised, and the mainstream media and social media trying to cover that up so that they can basically get Kamala Harris in as president should scare all of us. I wouldn't have said this a couple of days ago. You know, the Second Amendment, obviously, that's always on the table with the Democrats. But honestly, this time with the social media censorship and the mainstream media censorship of a major newspaper like the New York Post, a 200-year-old institution, our First Amendment is on the table this election. And if the Democrats win and allow big tech to keep doing their nonsense, uh, freedom of speech as we know it in this country is over. So what do you think would have happened if Donald Trump Jr. would have taken a $3.5 million wire transfer from the wife of the former mayor of Moscow? I'd be in jail. I'd be phoning into this call, not from my iPhone, but from a payphone at Rikers Island feeding quarters. That, that's what would happen. You know, that's the reality. This is money that couldn't uh, – regular U.S. banks wouldn't touch it because it was literally tied to prostitution rings and child trafficking rings. The Biden family is literally tied to these things. Now you have a Navy vet and former Biden friend coming out and saying, yeah, of course Joe knew about it today. Today he's saying it. Joe knew. After two years of lying, oh, he knew nothing about it. Yeah, the vice president knew nothing about his son making millions and millions of dollars, holding 10 for the big guy. Who do you think the big guy is? How do you think Joe Biden's income went from $300,000 a year to $17 million uh, since he left office? It's not because he's a great public speaker giving speeches. We've sort of seen how failed that is. So give me a break. This is disgusting. It's corruption at the highest levels. And it's it's honestly worse than that as it relates to the media and and the way they're handling it, because that that is truly disgusting, uh, what social media is trying to do to censor the truth uh, and help their preferred candidate win. So so what do you think all of these allegations against Hunter Biden mean about the judgment of his father to allow that to go on? I, I, I mean, <laughs> sort of a rhetorical question, but uh, it, it's obvious you know, they're okay with it. They're, they're okay with this. This is their family business. You know, get rich, right? Hunter's holding 10. You saw the other emails. Hey, you know, I've been carrying this family forever. So, yeah, he's, he's making a lot of money peddling influence, peddling access to the highest forms of government. You think Joe Biden's going to be tough on China when his son's making $30 million a year for the Biden family from them in his fund? You think he's going to be tough on China? He hasn't been yet. He spent decades being soft on China, pushing for their permanent status in the World Trade Organization, which destroyed more American jobs and blue-collar manufacturing jobs than anything in modern American history. But the media will pretend that, you know, oh, yeah, it's blue-collar Joe uh, fighting for America. Mm -hmm. It's not. He's fighting for himself and his son. Um, and, And, again, that people would turn a blind eye to this. You know, who knows? This is the compromising information that they hope that the Trumps were doing. Because they would oust us out of office. The Repub- if we did this, the Republicans would force my father to step down. And they'd be right. Sure. And they'd be right. But no one in the media, no one in the Democrat Party is saying this is even remotely a problem. They're now peddling Iranian disinformation. Right. The media and the Democrats are now knowingly peddling Iranian disinformation to try to hurt Donald Trump. And they're just fine with that. That should scare everyone. So it's officially hunting season in Michigan, and I know you're an avid hunter. So let's talk about Joe Biden's gun tax proposals. Breitbart News reports if Joe Biden has his way, current AR-15 owners could be hit with $3.6 billion in new taxes for guns that they already own. What's your message to hunters and gun owners who are undecided in this election? 
Yeah, well, listen, hunters, you know, hunters have traditionally sat out uh, elections. You know, they, I don't want to mix politics with my pastime. If you think that the AR-15 is the only thing on the table, you're wrong. I, as a vocal hunter, as someone who's supported those things and been out there, you know, the amount of hate mail I get from the left about hunting and this kind of stuff is insane. They're coming after all of those great American traditions. You see, they don't care about anything American. They would love to destroy all of that. It's not just your AR-15. Now, the taxation thing is crazy. And you saw what happened in California recently, right? The high-capacity magazine ban was overturned in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, where the Constitution goes to die, because there was a Trump appointee on that bench that said, this is ridiculous, it's unconstitutional. So they overturned the high-capacity magazine ban. That was a big overreach anyway in California because of a Trump judge. That's why we need four years. So hunters, you know, your pastime is on the table. They're, the other side, the left, their hobby is messing with your pastime. You guys better get involved. I've done a bunch of stuff, and I'm probably at the end of the month going to be going around uh, you know, Michigan with Ted Nugent, a good buddy of mine, great hunter, uh, you know, a couple other guys like that, you know, talking about just this. You have to get involved. You have to get out there and vote your values. Gun owners, it's sort of obvious. You think it stops at AR-15s? No, then it'll be semi-automatic shotguns because, you know, why do you need that third shot for uh, if you're going duck hunting? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it'll be everything. This is just the slippery slope that they want to start. We've seen that with the left. They try to get a little bit. They pretend they're reasonable. The next day, the next day when we concede and we try to be reasonable with them, the next day they're coming after the next thing. That's the way they play. We better wake up to it, and we better do something about it. So get out there, vote, understand that your AR-15 is on the line. For those new gun owners who bought guns in the last couple of months, who, many of whom could be Democrat, you know, they're going to try to confiscate that. The problem is the Democrats have also been pretty clear that they're willing to tell the police to stand down if something's happening in your neighborhood. So you're going to want that gun to possibly defend yourself and your family, a very basic American right. But you think the Democrats aren't going to try to go after everything? Because if you, if you think that, you haven't been watching. So Joe Biden apparently also wants to create a $200 tax for, quote, high-capacity magazines. He doesn't define high-capacity. It's probably more than one round. Um, but should supporters of the Second Amendment be worried about the prospect of a Joe Biden presidency? A hundred percent, because it's not Joe Biden. It's beyond that. No one believes Joe Biden's going to be in charge. Like, come on, mm -hmm. just look at the guy. Give me a break. It's Kamala Harris. It's Bernie I mean, it's that radical left. I mean, Joe Biden, like if we're talking hunting analogies, you know, Joe Biden is the camouflage to get in the radical left. The radical left doesn't believe in the Second Amendment at all. They'd love to get rid of all guns. I mean, high capacity is going to be a, you know, a five-shot revolver. Uh, you know, six shots will throw you over the limit if you have a conventional, you know, if you're not shooting a J-frame. Like, this is what will happen. They're utilizing Joe Biden. They'll say, oh, it's moderate Joe. It's moderate Joe. Don't worry. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen other than a couple billion dollar taxes on your AR, you know, and, and some taxes on, you know, magazines. I mean, I have a lot of guns. I probably have 400 magazines. Am I going to have to pay $200 for each one of my magazines because of what I have? Uh, does every little, you know, 10 round drum that I have for a 1022 for my kids to shoot, is that going to be taxed at a couple hundred dollars a year? I mean, that's going to be their plan. They're going to try to make it so cost prohibitive to be right. able to have guns that the average person will be forced to go away with it. And the problem is, like all gun control, you'll see it doesn't help stop crime. It doesn't do that. All it does is prevent law-abiding citizens, people who are willing to follow the law, from being able to defend themselves. Because I have a feeling criminals aren't going to pay the taxes. They're just going to keep it under their bed and not tell anyone. Right. That's right. And we're just about out of time, but Michigan is factoring majorly into the president's strategy for re-election. What are you doing to convince Michiganders to send your father back to the White House? Well, listen, it's about talking about his record. He created the strongest you know, economy America has ever seen. The guy that can do that, the guy that did that is the guy that can do it again. Hunter Biden today owns 10 percent. We're talking Michigan owns 10 percent of a Chinese company that is taking American manufacturing jobs out of Michigan and American technology and sending them to China. That's happening today. Mm -hmm. Think of the hypocrisy. They're not going to bat for you. Donald Trump renegotiated NAFTA, gave us the UMCA. Donald Trump got a trade deal done with China. Donald Trump is the guy actually fighting. Donald Trump is the guy doing all of the things that our politicians have talked about for decades. He's actually getting it done because he's willing to fight. He's willing to engage. He doesn't just listen to what some D.C. bureaucrat and special interests tell him to do. That's what Joe Biden has been doing for 47 years. If you're on the fence in Michigan, name a single Joe Biden accomplishment. Name mm -hmm. one. And if you can't, after half a century in the Washington, D.C. swamp, 
Doesn't that tell you everything you need to know? So get out there and vote and bring your friends. Don't take any of it for granted because they're coming after you. They're coming after your freedoms. They're coming after your liberties. And you don't have to look any further than the last four or five days to know that that's not hyperbole anymore. That's the real deal. Donald Trump Jr., thanks for joining me today. Thank you. This is the Kaya Olson Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Kaya Olson Show. The allegations against Joe and Hunter Biden continue to develop even as we speak, and they literally span the globe from Ukraine to China and beyond. Joining me now to break that down is M.A. Taylor, director of Riding the Dragon, the Biden's Chinese Secrets. It premiered on YouTube on September 4th and has over 1.3 million views already. It really is a complicated web of companies and individuals but break down what it means to the average voter. Absolutely. You know, the thing is, is that when you have, you know, families like the Bidens or, you know, or, or by extension, the Clintons, you know, they're, they set these things up so that they can hide their behavior, so they can hide their deals uh, with, with shadowy governments and things. And what we've done is we have created a baseline to explain the basics of how it works and what were the primary entities that were set up by Hunter Biden with the Chinese military, the the CCP and the Chinese government uh, that were facilitated by Joe Biden while he was the vice president of the United States. So the piece is called Riding the Dragon, the Biden's Chinese Secrets. You can find it on YouTube. Just search Riding the Dragon. Uh, it, was, it was produced or published by uh, The Blaze. But as you said, it's a really good baseline because I'm a visual person. And so to be able to see, you know, the, literally the connections that you're making on the screen to these individuals in these various companies, um, it, it's a very complicated scheme, but what you lay out is basically everywhere the vice president went, Vice President Biden, Hunter followed right behind it. In fact, the president these days is calling him the human vacuum, the human vacuum cleaner, which I think is just such a perfect description because that's really what was going on. Um, so that, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good baseline to then build upon all of these New York Post and Fox News and Breitbart and all of these various stories that are coming out. Um, what, what do you think the takeaway should be for the average uh, voter? Because, you know, I think a lot of people would say, well, everybody in government does this, uh, which may or may not be true. I don't think that's true. I hope that's not true. Um, but what does it mean to be for a, an elected official or someone who wants to be president? What does it mean for his family to literally be involved in business with the the Chinese Communist Party? Look, the, the thing to be that should be taken away is yes, there's plenty of investments by China into the into the United States. There's plenty of officials that play in the nepotism game. The issue with these particular deals is that every single deal that Hunter Biden participated in actually directly hurts national security and national interest, whether it's whether it's helping move sensitive airplane parts from the F-35 into Chinese hands, whether it's helping move nuclear secrets from from U.S. uh, facilities into Chinese hands. That's the real issue here. You know, again. If Bohai Harvest, which is the company that was that was um, that Hunter Biden owns a stake in, was investing in Disney or investing in Q-tips, uh, we would not have as big an issue. It would still be an issue that he maybe gained it in a unique way that's not market fair. The problem is that he gained these things um, that actually hurt Americans. Uh, they hurt this country. They advance the the Chinese agenda all over the world. And that's the problem. And the potential of Joe Biden becoming the president of the United States will merely amplify that because, again, he did this as vice president. And as president, he is already bought and paid for. The Chinese already gave Bohai Harvest one to one point five billion dollars. This is just the tip of the iceberg. So we will have a president that is already compromised by the Chinese if he were to be sworn in on January 20th. So there's one aspect to this whole web that you lay out in Riding the Dragon. 
Um, and that is the company called Hennigus. Um, now that's based in Michigan, um, which is where my listeners are. Um, but talk about that company and why, um, you know, why that's relevant to Michiganders. Well, you know, this is one of, I think, one of the more terrible deals. You know, Bohai Harvest, which again is is a company that was invested by the by the Chinese government, um, went in with Avic, which is one of the Chinese aviation companies that basically builds airplanes, and they got together and they bought Hennigus, the company, of course, that is in Michigan. And Hennigus is a dual use technology company, meaning they make technologies for consumer use, but they also make technology for military use. And so Avic bought 51% of this company and Bohai bought 49%, hence facilitating Avic's ability to steal technology that will be used in military vehicles. And if China were to ever go to war with the United States, that technology built by Americans in Michigan would be used to kill Americans in, say, the South China Seas. And that is why this deal is particularly uh, dangerous and particularly underhanded. You know, I'm sure that if, if Michigan workers knew that they were building technology to harm Americans and put the, the United States into jeopardy, they would be appalled. And on top of the fact that this deal had to actually be signed off by, by the Obama administration, in addition, so that's, that's problematic in, a, in and of itself. And so again, this is just one example of why their deals are particularly um, very, very bad, say even compared to the Clintons. You know, the Clintons made a lot of investments that were bad and a lot of underhanded things. But again, deforesting Colombia uh, does not particularly put American interests at risk, unlike say the Hennigas deal in Michigan um, that again, is it's it's one example of how a Biden presidency will play out uh, over the next four to eight years if he becomes the president. So it seems to me like Hunter was not the only one um, who was trading in on the Biden name. You also have Frank Biden and James Biden, who are Joe's brothers. Talk about uh, talk about some of their involvement in these various business ventures. Well, again, you know, I think that that and we do cover them. We cover them briefly in the film. It's a whole family affair. You know, they're lobbyists. That Valerie Biden is a political consultant. Um, Frank and James are government contractors through Joe. And of course, Hunter was a was a lobbyist at one point. So it is a whole family affair. It's it's borderline mafioso. Um, and so again, this is one of those things where you know Biden, or Joe Biden, is essentially the the golden child. He is the guy who will ascend through the public sector to set everything in motion and allow you know Valerie, Frank, James, and of course his son Hunter to you know as the president said vacuum up all of these deals. Um, it's the whole family's involved. And again, you know this is what can happen with Joe Biden as senator and eventually as vice president, uh, imagine what would happen if he were the actual president of the United States and how, how his family would be able to cash in on considerably more than just the deals we outline in Riding the Dragon. We're almost out of time, but what difference do you think it made for this story that Hunter Biden never went back to pick up that laptop? Well, you know, it's interesting because when, you know, our, our film is very fact-based. And again, we, we say, for example, some of these things are not really illegal. It's legal. It's just, it's very bad decisions. Sure. But what we're finding out now with the emails is that it is closing some of the gaps that we actually did not have when we made the film. For example, the CEFC, uh, the energy company, um, Patrick Ho calling calling uh, Biden uh Biden's brother to get through to Hunter. We knew it happened, but we weren't entirely sure why, uh, what the purpose was. Now the laptop has all of the connective tissue that we did not have uh, when we made the film. And so now it's all coming together. We are getting a very clear picture of how it all works on a, an a interior and intricate level. And again, every day is just more terrifying than the last as this story uh, basically uh, comes into resolution. It's stunning. It, I mean, it really, it's, it's hard to, 
it's hard to put into words to read these things, to watch your piece and think this is what this is what happened in the Obama administration and we could get more of the same if we have Joe Biden as president. But M.A. Taylor, director of Riding the Dragon, the Biden's Chinese Secrets. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. This is the Kaya Olson Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Kaya Olson Show. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg isn't just using his platform to censor conservatives and influence the election. He's using his vast financial resources to, according to the Amistad Project of the Thomas More Society, Zuckerberg is spending $350 million to, quote, support election officials with the infrastructure they need to administer the vote. That sounds nice. What a patriot. Joining me now to discuss that is director of the Amistad Project and former Kansas Attorney General Phil Klein. So, Phil, is Mark Zuckerberg spending his $350 million on solid red states like Kansas and South Dakota, <laughs> or is, some, is there something else going on? Well, hey, let me take you back to March of, of this year when David Plouffe, uh, President Obama's former campaign manager, published a book called The Citizen's Guide to Defeating Donald Trump. And in that document, in that book, he states, look, 2020, the election will come down to a block by block battle to turn out the vote in Minneapolis, Detroit, and Philadelphia. And you guessed it, that's exactly where Zuckerberg money is going. Philadelphia, Minneapolis, and Detroit. He's giving it through. Now, here's the problem, Kyle. You know, Mr. Zuckerberg has the right to do what he wants to do as a private citizen. Sure. He can support whoever he wants for an election. But instead of doing that, what he's, what he's doing is he's getting us to subsidize his effort by giving the monies to a charity and taking a tax deduction. And that charity is putting it in solid blue jurisdictions to turn out what was the Hillary Clinton vote for Joe Biden, and it's causing a disparate impact. Elections are supposed to be run by the states, not local governments. And so these monies are going into local governments. And let me just give you an example of what's happening in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, the Zuckerberg money is being used to set up satellite election offices, mobile units to pick up ballots, deputizing activists to go around and pick up ballots essentially harvesting ballots, which has not been allowed in Pennsylvania. And this is happening where there, Hillary Clinton, I think she won 85% of the vote in 2016 in Philadelphia. At the same time, a blue state governor is making it harder to vote than in more than a generation in rural areas. So in rural areas, people with pre-existing conditions who are worried about COVID have to drive round trip 60 miles to vote because there aren't as many in-person voting places. Hmm. So what his money is allowing is government to target one demographic to turn out and government to allow one demographic to have a difficult time voting. We've seen this before. That's voter suppression and government should not play favorites in an election. That's our concern. So the money you say is going to the Center for Tech and Civic Life. Um, Tell me about that organization. Well, that organization, as early as May of this year, reached out to the Democrat mayor of Racine, Wisconsin, and gave him $100,000 to keep 60 of it for his city and to use the remainder to go recruit cities, Milwaukee, um, Kenosha, those cities that, again, turned out the vote for Hillary Clinton. See. TCL is operated by three persons formerly associated with the Obama administration, and they broke out of a Democrat activist group. And when they left that group, um, that group, which could uh, engage directly in partisan activity, a 501c3 can't, but the partisan group announced that they were continuing everything that they were trying to do, but as a 501c3. So, you know, let me back up, though. The real problem is not that Mr. Zuckerberg is telling people where to put the money. It's that he's running the election. 
he's telling cities how many polling places they will have and that if they do not have it, they're going to take back their money. He's acting as the government in running an election and we can't privatize an election. Imagine if this was Charles Koch doing this. Right. What would be happening? And I'll tell you what, if this is allowed, that everybody's going to be doing in the next election. Have you ever seen anything like that before? It's unprecedented. For, first of all, we've never seen such a consolidation of wealth and power in one person's hands. The information that Facebook has is astounding. Their mm -hmm. ability to determine what Americans hear and learn about is remarkable. And the wealth generated from that power is unprecedented. And now all of that power is being exercised to influence the election. That is deeply, deeply concerning. So the Amistad Project is fighting back. Tell me exactly what you're doing. Well, we have initiated litigation. We're trying to inform the public about it. Um, we've provided briefings to those who ask. And, and we're, we're getting interest and concern. I think a broad swath of the American public recognizes the problem here. It's just that in this environment, um, there's not much attention to anything but presidential politics. So it's difficult for people to step back and, and pause for a second and consider the fact that Mark Zuckerberg is paying the election judges in Philadelphia. The, the people who are gonna determine what ballots are counted and whether a ballot is valid and the final tally are being paid by Zuckerberg. Now that should raise alarm bells everywhere. <laughs> How, uh, so w what is the mechanism to uh, fight back? I don't, I don't know what the word is, but what's the, what, what, what's the mechanism, uh, what's the oversight for that? Well, we, we, it, again, it's unprecedented, and they are betting that we can't respond in time and that the election's going to be over before we can do anything. But we have filed eight federal lawsuits seeking to stop this, and we're, we're pursuing those suits aggressively. And, and seeking remedies as it relates to that. The Attorney General of Louisiana has, has joined the effort. Um, we've been conversing with them, and uh, I believe it was two weeks ago, he initiated a lawsuit on behalf of the state of Louisiana, and that money has stopped flowing to Louisiana. So other states are, are taking notice, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're the David, and we're facing the Goliath, and we could use as many people becoming aware of this and taking action against it as we can find. So I would encourage people to raise the alarm, contact their legislators, and, and say we can't privatize our elections. They can't be run by billionaires. So Zuckerberg is using his, his personal financial resources to do this. But to me, when you see what Facebook and, and Twitter are doing, uh, but Facebook obviously specifically, to me, it all just sort of runs together. I mean, if you've got, if you have a, a, a platform, uh, an outlet, it's, it's not a platform, it's an outlet, um, like Facebook, regulating what people are, are able to say, and then you've got the CEO of that company doing all of this, um, I mean, it, it just sort of all runs together. So long term, how should these big tech companies be regulated when it comes to electioneering and picking and choosing who gets to speak and what they get to say? Yes, well, as it relates to elections, we have to clearly prohibit the use of private funds to manage elections. Nobody should be able to stuff the umpire's pocket with cash before the game begins. And that's what's happening. So we have to prohibit it and stop it. And we're hoping that the courts will see that and do that. And also legislators will pass legislation expressly prohibiting it. We have to remove the protections that we have given to big tech that have allowed them to flourish and to have um, the ability to censor like they're censoring today. And I think Congress is finally starting to recognize um, that is a concern. And then we have to use antitrust law to tackle some of these corporations and break up that power because it's too harmful to our democracy to have this narrow of a chokehold on free speech. Um, free speech is the lifeblood 
of a healthy democracy. So you have less than 10 business days left before the election. Are you going to be able to stop this? We're hoping, we're trying, we're doing all that we can, and we're pressing forward aggressively. Hmm. It, it's, it seems very disturbing to me. And I, uh, what, uh, so you, you're, you're filing these suits. What can states be doing right now? The, the states that you mentioned, Michigan, which obviously Attorney General Dana Nessel, she's not going to be a partner in this, or she'll, she'll be on Zuckerberg's side. Phil Klein, director of the Amistad Project of the Thomas More Society. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, hey, Kyle, can I can I encourage your listeners to go to a specific website? Yes, absolutely. www.got-freedom.com. And they're keeping up to speed with what's happening. Okay. Got-freedom.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you so much for joining me today. For more of my work, go to Breitbart.com or find me on Twitter, Kyle Olson4. Use the same handle for Parler, Kyle Olson4, K-Y-L-E. O-L-S-O-N and the number four. This is The Kyle Olsen Show.